You've written this loop before. You've probably written this loop a hundred times, or a thousand times, or a hundred thousand times. This is a simple loop. It's always the same, always follows the same pattern. But there's another kind of loop, one that isn't so simple, a non-trivial loop, if you will. And you've probably written some of these too, but not a hundred thousand times, just ten times or a hundred times. And they're always hard and they're always error prone. In this video, I'll show you how to write these non-trivial loops and teach you the technique for nailing them every time. This is the art of software development. We're going to look at a problem that involves palindromes. If you're not familiar with palindromes, they're words that are spelled the same forwards and backwards. Words like dad and race car. Single characters are also a palindrome. And it's important to note that these examples are all odd length, but they're also even length palindromes. So the question we have is, given a string S and a position P in that string, find the longest palindrome in S centered at P. And so we should write a function something like this. So let's look at what that would look like. So I've got a string, I have a point, and I'm going to start two pointers there and just slowly but surely move them out as long as we still have a palindrome, and boom, now I have the longest palindrome. And where this can be a little bit tricky is if you have an even numbered one, you wouldn't start your two pointers at the same spot, you would start them apart, but then they would also just move out and you would have the longest palindrome. So let's actually modify our statement a little bit. Instead of having a position P, let's have two positions, P1 and P2, and either they're equal or one is one more than the other. So that'll handle the even case and the odd case. And so we want the longest palindrome that's still centered right where those two are. So just to make sure that everything's clear, in the examples we had before, uh, here's what P1 and P2 would be. You can see they're either the same or they're off by one. All right, here we are in code. I'm writing Java code today, no particular reason. I just like to mix it up. And here's our class with the function in it. And before we write the actual function, let me just write something that kind of outlines the function. Now, I hope you'll agree that that makes sense. We've got before, during, and after the loop. And the loop itself is going to look something like this. And I could have written this exact same code even for a different problem. Like all, all loops you write have this. They have before, during, and after, and they have a condition, and they do something. So now we want to introduce a concept called the loop invariant. The loop invariant is something that is always true. So let me go ahead and introduce my left and right variables, and then I'll write the loop invariant in terms of those. So the invariant here is that the substring from left to right inclusive is a palindrome. And that has to be true before we get into the loop, and during the loop and after the loop. Okay, so that's the first thing. We have this loop invariant, and there are always these four spots where we have to make sure the invariant is true. Like if you write a different function that solves a different problem, the same spots the loop invariant has to be true. What the loop invariant is will be different for different functions. The thing inside the while loop, this is the loop condition. And when we get out of the while loop, we know that the condition is false. So 
So it needs to be the case that the loop invariant is true and the condition is false, and that's enough to get us the answer we want. So the condition we're going to use is there is a larger palindrome. And so saying that's false is the same as saying there is not a larger palindrome. And that means that we have found the longest palindrome. And so once we've found the longest palindrome, what we want to do is just return that. And I have write plus one here because in Java, when you do substring, it does not include the right character, but we actually need to include the right character. Before the loop, we need to write code that will set up our invariant. Now I'm gonna do something a little bit weird here. I'm gonna replace P1 and P2 with left and right. But if you look at it, you're gonna be like, well, wait, what's going on here? Like these are backwards. And it'll make more sense in a second, but essentially what I'm looking for is the overlapping string. So if I, if I start at the left and show that string in red, and if I start and show the string that ends at right in blue, you can see that those two overlap in this sort of purple string, which is the letter E. Now that's because this is one of these odd length ones where the two start at the same spot. What if they start at different spots? Well, the middle may not be a palindrome. So here it actually makes some sense that we would want to have the overlap be the empty string. And we could probably do it where we have separate cases for even and odd, and we could have separate cases for if the two original positions match or not. But I hate writing loops like that. I hate writing code like that that has lots of extra cases that we don't need. It's a lot cleaner if we find the general case. And the general case is a little bit weird. It's that we swap left and right when we go. All right, now we understand where this is coming from. So we'll say left is equal to P2, right is equal to P1. So that sets up the loop invariant for the even and the odd case. For the odd case, it's a single character. So it has to be a palindrome. For the even case, it's the empty set also is a palindrome. I'm going to skip ahead to inside the loop. So inside the loop, if there's a longer palindrome, that means we can just grow. We can say left minus minus, right plus plus. And notice something important here. Um, the loop invariant was true here. Left to right is a palindrome. It's true again because we've extended. But here in the middle, like right here, right there it wouldn't be true because we've extended left and we haven't extended right. And so the way I like to think about this is that the internals of the loop have to follow the sitcom rule. So the sitcom rule is no matter what weird stuff happens in the middle, by the end everything is back to normal. So left and right can be weird in the middle, but by the end you still get a palindrome. In an actual sitcom, let's say The Simpsons, one of the characters can leave and cannot be part of the family anymore, but by the end of the episode, they're back. On Gilligan's Island, someone might figure out a way to escape from the island, but by the end, they're back on the island. So everything has to be back to normal by the end of the loop. Not in the middle. In the middle of the episode, in the middle of the loop, it can be all as weird as you want. Maybe Bart went to live with Mr. Burns, or maybe Marge and Homer are getting divorced, or who knows what. But by the end, everything's back to normal, because it's the sitcom rule. So now we have the only tricky part left is, while there is a longer palindrome. So what that means is that if we extend to the left and to the right, it's still a palindrome. 
So first off, it has to be safe to extend. So let's do that. And then the two characters have to match. And so that means that there is a longer palindrome just by extending one. And we're sort of done. So let's just quickly rehash what we did. Now we did this for a specific example, but this is in general what you could do. We came up with a loop invariant. We put it in a comment right before the loop, at the first line of the loop, at the last line of the loop, and right after the loop. We wrote the code before the loop to make sure that the invariant gets established. We came up with a loop condition and we use the fact that the invariant equals true and the condition equals false to write code after the loop. And at this point, our condition was just kind of in words. It wasn't in code yet. It was that there isn't a bigger one, or sorry, that there is a bigger one. And then we wrote code inside the loop that reestablishes the invariant before the next iteration. And that was the sitcom rule that we had to follow. Okay, I'm going to get rid of all these comments right now. And there's actually something else we need to take care of. So the loop needs to make progress each time through. So if I get rid of the guts of the loop, all of the invariants are still true, but this loop won't work because it doesn't do anything. So there's another concept we need, which is the loop variant. And I'm going to write that. So what we essentially want is the loop variant should be a number. It should be a number that decreases. And it should be a number that has a bound. It should be an integer, not just any number. And it should decrease by a certain amount each time. So. I'll just put a comment here. So the loop variant here is going to be the unexplored length of the string. So it's the total length of the string minus the length of the substring that we have, which is just right minus left plus one. And so you can see each time through the loop here, right is going to go up, which means that this quantity because there's a minus sign in front of it, will go down. And minus and minus gives us a plus. So when left goes down, the quantity, the variant goes down. So each time through the loop, the amount of unexplored length goes down by two. So the minimum this can ever be is zero, because at some point we could have no unexplored length. But each time through, we're going to decrease by two. So let's say we have a really long string that comes in that's like the thousand. It's going to take at most 500 iterations before we have to end because whenever we get this number to zero, we pop out of the loop. We have to pop out of the loop because it's bounded. So that proves that the loop will eventually end. Now, this particular loop is kind of simple and you could probably figure out that, yeah, this is going to end. But you might have a more complicated thing and you'd be like, well, does it or does it get an infinite loop? And so having a loop variant like this shows you that it will happen. If the loop terminates, we'll get the right answer. That's what the invariant guarantees. But there's a catch. The catch is the if. And so that's why we have to use the loop variant, because that's what guarantees that the loop does terminate. So the invariant makes sure that if it terminates, you get the right answer. The variant makes sure that it does terminate. And between the two of those, you have a loop that works correctly. Let me just finish up by talking about one of my favorite programming books. This is Programming Pearls by John Bentley, and if you've never had a chance to read it, I highly recommend it. One of the things he talks about in the book is one of these complicated loops. It's binary search. And so he describes it in words where you have a sorted array and you're looking for a certain target number. And then what you do is you start with a range that's the whole array and then split the range in half, compare that, throw away half of the range, 
do that again, do that again. And eventually you either get to the index that you're looking for or you figure out that your target isn't in the array. And so the cool thing about the book is Bentley gave this problem. He gave the problem with the description of the algorithm, not just the problem, but here's in words how to do the algorithm. He gave that to a bunch of professional programmers and he tried to get them to write it and 90% of them couldn't. 90% of the code he looked at definitely had bugs in it. And some of the other 10% he suspected had bugs but couldn't quite figure out whether or not it did. So if you use the techniques we've talked about in this video, loop invariant, loop variant, and the loop condition, you could go through and write a binary search and get it 100% right the first time. So that's why this technique is super useful. And I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe.